y'all, we just need to take a real quick moment and thank our sponsor of today's video, Skillshare. Skillshare is a huge online learning community with thousands of inspiring and creative classes for anyone who loves to learn, including myself. Y'all know that the best part of a true crime video is, well, the video. I found this really awesome class by Ali Abdal on using Final Cut Pro X. Now, while my husband does help me out with a lot of the video editing, sometimes I have to jump in myself, and that's where Skillshare comes in. You aren't forced to commit to a three-hour class all at once. Instead, you can watch all or just a portion of the class and really hone in on areas where you feel you really need improvements. Oh, and here's the best part. The first thousand of my viewers to sign up through my link in the description will get a one month's free trial of Skillshare. So what are you waiting for? Click the link in the description and start exploring your creativity today. Greetings, beloved. My name is Erica Hogue. My gift is a divinity of presence that offers one a natural opening of consciousness. With honor and intention being centralized to the relief of the identity mind and to bring a pathway to a more self-sighted awareness. Erica Renee Hogue was born on June 7, 1978. She was described as a free spirit, a bright light who didn't let the grass grow under her feet. She attended Caldwell High School in Idaho and became a stay-at-home mom and meditation teacher. In addition, she spent time as a self-proclaimed, non-denominational minister and loved the outdoors. She worked in personal care and nanny services, among many other jobs, including assisting adults with developmental delays. She eventually married and moved into a house at 1038 Northwest Baltimore in Bend, Oregon. In her late 20s or early 30s, she was diagnosed with schizophrenia and became classified as disabled. Despite this mental illness, she was not medicated because she was unwilling to tolerate the side effects they caused. She also lacked the funds needed for the frequent medical visits and further treatments. She eventually lost custody of her two children and her marriage ended up falling apart. Soon after, she began to mingle and embrace the community known as the Rainbow Family, a culture that began around the 60s or 70s and consisted of mostly nomadic and hippie-style individuals with no specific leader. She began a YouTube channel that has videos of her reading poetry and various other topics. In 2004, she began participating in the spiritual awareness community of the Cascades after having her own spiritual awakening. Just a heads up, I am by no means an expert in the spiritual awareness community, but I will do my best to describe what Erica was into. Over the next few years, Erica was practicing conscious quickening, which has something to do with exploring alternate states of consciousness. With her newfound experience, she became an open translator of the Word of Spirit through the use of sound and language. She also helped others become creators of circumstance instead of creatures of circumstance. Her physical appearance also began to change drastically as she went on a personal spiritual journey. At the age of 39, she lived with her boyfriend, Larry Anthony Hopkins, a.k.a. Hannibal, at 7875 Deer Creek Road in rural Selma, Oregon, in what is described as a campsite or a trailer. Also, Erica and Anthony both worked on a nearby cannabis farm. At some point, Anthony called Erica's sister, Rachel Carter, concerned that she had disappeared from their campground and never returned during one of her manic states. He said she had gone to a neighbor's house and property owner, Ryan Floyd Bargay, to shower, something she and Anthony often did. Her mental state began to spiral downward after she attempted to call and speak to her children on Mother's Day, but no one answered her calls. The night of Mother's Day, Anthony said she was walking around naked as she often did. 
He said she was hallucinating, talking to people that weren't there, and speaking a lot about her children. He said she asked for personal time, and he let her be alone to calm down. He eventually fell asleep, and when he woke up later, Erica was nowhere to be found. Strangely, the neighbor who let her shower in his home reported a missing gun after Erica showered at his house and disappeared. However, Erica had a strong aversion and fear of firearms, so it's unclear if she took it or not. It is also important to note that the two had a history of drug use, including meth, but it's unknown if they were under the influence the night she went missing. Rachel reported her sister missing and headed to Oregon to search for her. The family posted on social media, put up missing person flyers, and even hired Harry Oaks, a private dog handler, to explore the grounds. The dog tracked Erica's scent along several trails where she went missing, but one path in particular stood out, leading to speculation that she may have caught a ride out of the area. Her scent was followed a couple of miles through the woods and ultimately to a group of mailboxes by the road and then toward the city of Bend, where her children lived three hours away. All reports state that on May 17, 2018, Erica was last seen walking in the 7800 block of Deer Creek Road in Selma, fully clothed in a remote and densely wooded area amidst vineyards and cannabis farms. It's unclear why there's a discrepancy about her being naked versus fully clothed. Her family describes her as an adventurous woman who's dropped out of sight before on impromptu trips and is known to travel to Bend, Oregon. She has also been homeless before and bounced around from state to state, frequently having a flight of ideas related to her schizophrenia. But Rachel said this time felt different, and despite Erica's nomadic lifestyle, she never went without communication for more than a few days. Her sister Jill Lindsay Stevenson put a missing person reward on social media to help locate her. A couple of months later, her van was located in California, driven by a man named Ryan Taylor. During a traffic stop, Taylor told the officer that he purchased the vehicle from Erica but did not have any documentation for it. The officer at the time of the traffic stop was unaware of Erica's missing person case until the next day. Any further details regarding Taylor or the van are unknown. It doesn't appear that either has been located for further investigation, but her family would like to speak with the driver. About a year after her disappearance, Anthony was arrested for possession of meth, reckless driving, and reckless endangerment. Once he was released from jail around April of 2019, he allegedly stumbled upon her favorite beloved homemade bong and lanyard she used to hold her lighter that she never went anywhere without, along with a new Shanka hat with ear flaps and turned them over to police. Strangely, the items were allegedly discovered by Anthony about 100 yards from their campsite, but were somehow missed by the trained canine. Erica's closest friend, Miranda, stated that in the past, she and Erica and Anthony were traveling in Erica's van when the pair got into a heated argument and Anthony attempted to push Erica out of the moving van. Interestingly, two and a half months after Erica's disappearance, Anthony was texting another woman, trying to get her to stay with him on the farm where Erica had lived with him, in the exact location where Erica was last seen alive. He also explained the events of the night of her disappearance differently than he had before. Previously, he described her walking around either naked or half-naked, hallucinating and in a manic state. A year or so later, he explained that she was lying in bed trying to calm down, and he walked to the nearby farm for a couple of hours, and when he returned, she was gone. Since her disappearance, she has missed medical appointments and her children's birthdays, hasn't renewed her disability benefits or medical card, and hasn't touched her bank account. Erica never lost contact with her loved ones, no matter where she was. They want answers to what happened to her and want to lay her to rest if she is indeed deceased. They desire closure no matter if she's alive or dead. 
Did she run into trouble on a nearby cannabis farm that night or steal the gun and harm herself? Did she hitchhike out of there with the wrong person? Did she even make it off the campsite alive or did she meet with foul play at the hands of her boyfriend? Her family believes that she is likely deceased because despite her mental health concerns, they do not believe she would ever go without speaking with her children, sisters, or close friends. Multiple agencies have investigated the case, including the Josephine County Sheriff's Office, FBI, and Oregon State Police. One of Erica's sisters provided her DNA to be compared to any unidentified remains that are located. A resident of Selma, Oregon, Gwen Berenger, has created a four-part series detailing Erica's case titled A Light for Erica because the media has given this case very little attention. As of September 2022, Erica has never been found and this case remains unsolved. Michael Benjamin Watts was born on May 17, 1983, to parents Susan and Patrick Watts, and later graduated from Adolfo Camarillo High School in California. As an adult, he was described as a multi-talented, intelligent, muscle-bound genius with a heart of gold who went out of his way to support friends. He also became a massive icon in the local queer community and was said to make them feel safe. He was known as Freddie Hollywood and began performing as a Freddie Mercury impersonator, the late singer of the band Queen. In addition, he was a stage comedian, a nightclub doorman at clubs, and Hollywood actor, among other talents. In his later 30s, Michael focused more on his private security company, worked as an armed security guard at a hospital in Eugene, Oregon, and spoke of going to nursing school. He was described as friendly, reliable, and much loved by the LGBTQ community in Portland for his performances. He was also engaged to a woman named Amanda, whom he had been with for 10 years. On April 30, 2021, 37-year-old Michael returned to his hometown of Portland to visit friends and discuss upcoming performances at a local venue. He reportedly stayed at the AC Marriott Hotel on Southwest 3rd Avenue and Taylor Street. The next day, May 1, 2021, he used his debit card at an ATM at the C.C. Slaughter's nightclub where he bought drinks. He often danced at the C.C. Slaughter's nightclub and Stag PDX under the Freddie Mercury persona. At about 10 p.m., he was on a FaceTime video call with his fiancée. He told her that he had just left the bar and was walking back to his hotel, but according to his fiancée, she could see his location on her Find My Friends app and told him he was going the wrong way. About 26 minutes into the call, a group of people began chasing him, and Michael said, they're right behind me, before the call ended abruptly, allegedly around 12th and Salmon. If this is true, it is strange given the location of the bar and the hotel. From the hotel, the bar is roughly 10 blocks north. 12th and Salmon is the same distance from the hotel but west. Therefore, if that's the case, he may have actually been walking in the opposite direction of his hotel. Was he doing this to avoid the possible group of people following him? It was speculated that he might have been caught up in the civil unrest happening near his hotel known as the May Day Riots. Either way, his loved ones say that for Michael to run away from conflict is very out of character, so the threat had to be significant. His sister, Carly Dash, reported that her brother was trained in martial arts, was a stuntman for many years, and was also a bodybuilder. Therefore, Somebody couldn't just easily take him, and a physical altercation would have most likely occurred. Later, Michael's phone was found in the street, far from where his location pinged when the call was dropped. His car was also found, still parked near the hotel. His loved ones reported him missing and began searching for him. They even offered a reward for information that would lead to his whereabouts. Sadly, 10 days later, 
His body was found in the Willamette River near the Fremont Bridge by deputies with the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office River Patrol. It is unclear what his cause of death was or where the investigation stands, but as of September 2022, this case remains unsolved. Teresa Ann Davidson Murphy was born on May 15, 1965, to parents Yvonne and Richard Reich, and went by the nickname Terry. Standing six feet tall, she was described as funny, soft-spoken, and very intelligent. And her mother, Yvonne, said she was the perfect kid that grew to be a wonderful and devoted mother. She married Stephen Colpitts, and the couple had two children together, Justin and Jessica. But the marriage ended in 1989, and Terry and the kids moved around to different states with loved ones before settling in Covington, Washington. By the age of 34, she was working at a Boeing aircraft manufacturing facility and met a man named Richard Murphy, whom she would marry in July of 1998. In 1999, about a year into their relationship, they relocated from Puyallup, Washington to the 72,000 block of Hutchinson Road in Rainier, Oregon to be closer to Richard's family. Terry didn't really want to move because it took her away from her loved ones, the house she had been paying for, and her job with Boeing. Also, Richard and her son did not get along, and it was said that Richard could be violent with him at times. Terry was starting to see a side of Richard that troubled her. So while her daughter remained with Terry and Richard, her son moved six hours away to Klamath Falls to live with his father. It would later be revealed that Richard had a violent past and had even abused his ex-wife. On October 7, 1999, Terry dropped her 13-year-old daughter, Jessica, off at a friend's home for a three-night sleepover because the girls had a volleyball game out of state. This friend happened to be Richard's cousin's daughter. Later that same day, Richard left for a camping trip to Browns Creek in the Olympic National Forest in Mason County, Washington, and claimed to have seen Terry after she dropped her daughter off. Two days later, on October 9th, Jessica called her mother and spoke to her about the volleyball game she had played that day. She recalled that her mother didn't sound like herself, but didn't think much of it at the time. Terry was scheduled to pick Jessica up the next day, but strangely never arrived. Jessica called home several times, trying to reach her, but no one answered, so she stayed with her friend again. The next day, there was still no word from Terry. Jessica spent the next few days at her friend's house while trying to get in touch with her mother. Finally, Richard answered the home phone and said he had returned from his camping trip and had no idea where Terry was. Days later, Richard drove to pick up his stepdaughter from his cousin's home. Jessica noticed that his usually dirty van that he used for construction and his pest control business was spotless. It was even odder because she said it had never been cleaned before. He told her that her mother was into drugs and wouldn't be back. He began badmouthing Terry and likely told the police negative things about her to make them believe she ran off for drugs or another man on purpose. Those that knew Terry knew that everything he was saying was a lie. They knew she would never leave her children and was definitely not a drug user. Richard's camping trip around the time Terry disappeared was allegedly never verified. It was also noted that his camping items had not been moved from their original spot. Jessica went to live with her father and brother Justin, confused and concerned about her mother's whereabouts. Richard claimed he called numerous hospitals and searched for Terry, and her family assumed he reported her missing, but he hadn't. Her pickup truck remained near the house with the keys in the ignition, and all her belongings remained inside the home. She was finally reported missing 16 days after being last seen, not by her husband, but by her sister-in-law, Julie Reich. Richard told the police that the only thing missing besides Terry was a Colt 1911 A1 45 caliber semi-automatic handgun. He provided them with the serial number, but the gun was never located. 
It is of note that at some point before her disappearance, Terry's father died, leaving her a good bit of money and guns. Richard would strangely have a girlfriend not even a month after Terry went missing. Richard then put Terry's stuff in a storage unit. Jessica asked to retrieve those items, but Richard never made the payments and her stuff was auctioned off. He also sold her pickup truck that was in her name. Eventually, Jessica moved in with her maternal grandparents and said growing up without her mother was extremely difficult because the two were very close. Terry's mother recently turned 80 and desperately wants to find answers before she passes away. Her daughter now runs a Facebook page titled Help Find Teresa Davidson. As of September 2022, Teresa has never been found and this case remains unsolved. Michael Anthony Bryson was born to parents Parrish and Tina Bryson and as a teenager would attend Harrisburg High School in Oregon. He was described as a friendly person with a bright smile that never met a stranger. He was said to love life, his family, and electric dance music. He was the kind of person that would give you the shirt off his back and try his best to make you laugh. He would go on two mission trips to Africa and wanted to continue helping and was thinking of possibly relocating there. He was also a DJ that was invited to perform sets at parties and raves across the state. In early August of 2020, Josie Hill, called Josie Birthday Girl or Astoria Catlin, threw herself a large 21st birthday party outside at a campsite with over 50 people. The party was located outside Eugene, Oregon, near Dorena on a remote mountain in the Umpqua National Forest and lasted several days. The party, which was basically a rave, was in an area known as the Hobo Campground. There were two old buses, a stage with music, a campfire, drugs, and alcohol. On August 3rd, 2020, 27 year old Michael stopped by his parents' house in Harrisburg, Oregon before he and a friend, Ben Doughty Primeval, headed out to attend the multi day party. While there, he was having a good time and had even DJed on stage. However, on the third day, August 5th, around 4 a.m., Michael was allegedly sitting atop the larger bus with a female named Ashley at a table. He was overheard saying to her or someone, what, you don't want me here? He allegedly became upset, walked away from the campsite, and vanished, leaving his camping gear behind. His cell phone was turned off, and no one saw which direction he was heading. Michael was wearing black athletic-type shorts, rainbow Crocs, and a brown corduroy baseball hat. However, it's unclear if he had a shirt on then. About 12 hours later, his parents were notified of his disappearance. When they arrived at the site, no one in the area seemed concerned and was still partying. For days, hundreds of volunteers showed up to scour miles of heavily wooded wilderness in the area. They searched on foot, on horseback, and with drones. Search and rescue brought K-9 to assist, but no trace of Michael was found. Law enforcement states that they never got a straight answer from the partygoers, only numerous inconsistent stories. Although a few remained behind to assist in the search, many of them left the day he disappeared and continued partying elsewhere as if nothing had ever happened. Over the next few months, searchers would often stumble upon bones and notify authorities, but it was always determined to be animal bones. Then strangely, a few months later, following up on a tip, the sheriff's office found something new. Multiple items of clothing in the woods that Michael was last seen wearing. It is speculated that the items were planted there by someone as the area had been thoroughly searched numerous times before. Partygoers that night do not recall the altercation where he got upset and walked away. His parents firmly believe their son was murdered and some party goers know the details but are too afraid to come forward. Here is a list of many of the party goers that were known to be at the party. 
His parents created a nonprofit called the Michael Bryson Foundation, aimed at helping families solve missing person cases and to help advocate for those with mental illness. His parents and loved ones remain devastated because of their missing son and the missing details. Is foul play involved, or did he get lost or injured and has yet to be found? There have been many rumors and finger pointing, but if there was foul play, the family hopes that someone will come forward and clear their conscience. As of September 2022, Michael has never been found and this case remains unsolved. This next story does not have a lot of solid details and instead has numerous conflicting reports, but this is the best explanation I can give about this case. Toby Eugene Anderson was born on December 18, 1969, to parents Jean and Nikki Anderson and was the eldest of three children and initially lived in Northern California. As a child, he was described as quiet and kind but also a jokester who loved the outdoors and making people laugh. Things went downhill after his parents divorced and his mother remarried. Although he primarily lived with his father, he sometimes stayed with his mother. But those visits were less than ideal because his stepfather was physically abusive to him and his mother. Around 11 or 12 years old, he was sent to juvie after an altercation with his mother and stepfather. Once Toby was released, he moved back in with his father and the pair would begin working on restoring a Jeep together, something Toby really enjoyed. At some point, he was sent back to juvie for taking his father's truck without permission. Once released, he began staying with his uncle Randy on his mom's side in California. Due to his continued troubles, his father asked his half-brother Billy, a different uncle of Toby's, to take him in. He agreed and Toby was sent to live with the Wright family in Selma, Oregon in 1986. He planned to help Wright work on the land and enrolled in Illinois Central Middle School. But unbeknownst to the family, Wright was a sadistic child rapist with severe mental health issues. Later that year, in the fall of 1986, Toby would vanish. His uncle Wright said, that Toby had run away, which was initially believed because of his past troubles. Around 1990, Toby's father passed away from leukemia, leaving a final note stating if Toby was found to let him know he loved him. A couple of years after that, Toby's mother passed away. Numerous members of both sides of his family had not kept in close contact with each other for multiple reasons, including living in different states and a history of sexual abuse against other family members. Toby's younger sister, Marcy, and younger brother, Randy, were very young when their brother went missing. They only had a few vague memories of him, especially Randy, because he was the youngest. Many believed that Toby would return once he turned 18, but that never happened. So they decided to try and find out what happened to their brother all those years ago, still believing he had run away. Unable to find any record of their brother's name and birth date, Marcy turned to her cousin, Denise McGarity. She offered to help investigate in 2016 and made it her mission to find answers. She discovered much of the information I have discussed thus far and some additional alarming information. For three decades, the consensus among the disconnected family was that Toby had run away as a teenager. Others in the family did not like to speak of the past and wanted to let things be, but his siblings weren't going to let that continue to happen. When Denise began her investigation, it was widely unknown that Toby had gone to live in Oregon with his uncle Wright. This move to Oregon was never discussed with the younger family members who would later be tasked as adults to figure it out on their own. When Denise began investigating, Toby would have been approaching 50 years of age. However, what she uncovered led to the belief that he likely never lived past the age of 16. After much research and reaching out to extended family, it was established that the last time Toby was seen alive was when he lived with his uncle Wright, his wife, and Wright's four daughters in Selma, Oregon in 1986. 
His father had attempted to report him missing, but law enforcement refused due to his juvenile history, stating that he was undoubtedly a runaway and not missing. When Denise located her uncle, Almer Willis Wright, who went by Billy, he was incarcerated in Arkansas on rape and sexual assault charges. He was sentenced in 2000 for raping his second wife's two- and four-year-old granddaughters and molesting her seven-year-old grandson soon after they married. Wright was serving a 30-year sentence and was eligible for parole in September 2021, but was denied. Denise wrote to Wright about Toby's disappearance, and he replied with very inconsistent explanations. He claimed that Toby had been caught trying to touch one of his daughters, and he and Toby got into a fight about it. Wright said that he had his wife take the girls and go to a family member's house. He said he then found Toby hiding in the chicken coop, drove him to the Cave Junction Police Department, dropped him off at the front door, and drove away. As the police officer told him he couldn't do that, he replied, he's your problem now. However, when she inquired with them, the police told Denise there would have been documentation of the incident, which there wasn't, and his next of kin would have been notified to pick him up. Furthermore, when he let his wife and four daughters return the following day after staying the night with family, he told them that he had taken Toby to a detention center the night before. However, there was no detention center within hours of their home, especially none that would have taken a child in the middle of the night. Other claims were that he died in a car accident, that he joined the circus, and that his other uncle killed him. During Denise's investigation, she reached out to Wright's four daughters to get their side of the story. However, they refused to talk. Finally, one of them said for her to find the truth and wouldn't speak any further. The other two declined to discuss it, and the eldest of the four told her to mind her business and defended her father. Wright's wife, who later passed away, was described as a meek and lovely lady. She had even once told one of her young female relatives to stay close to her when she was visiting one day. It appears that she was well aware of her husband's ways and wanted to protect the girl. It's also said that her daughters had a hard time growing up and blocked out many of their childhood memories. It is also rumored that the girls were victims of sexual abuse at the hands of their father, but this has never been confirmed. One of the girls stated that she and Toby had to share a bed, and maybe his foot touched her, but no further details were given. Many speculate that with the horrific abuse that Wright has placed on other children, Toby possibly witnessed something between Wright and his daughters, or maybe he refused to participate in something very inappropriate, and Wright killed him because of it. At one point, Wright wrote in a letter stating that Toby was probably dead, and if he was, he was killed after being struck in the back of the head with a hoe and buried on a property in California. None of these stories were given in the initial years following his disappearance. Instead, he either claimed that Toby took off and never returned because he was a problem child, or that he dropped him off at the police station. Other family members told Denise that after Toby went missing, Wright threatened them, saying they would end up on a hill just like Toby. Interestingly, there is a hill behind the house on the five-acre property they lived on at the time. Denise learned that as soon as Toby went missing, Wright told his school that he had gone back to California to live with his father and wouldn't be returning. This is a telltale sign that he knew he would never return because it was a lie. Wright then moved his family to Melvin, Arkansas in the middle of the night. He lied and said he had to care for his sick mother, but his mother was not ill at all. She was only in her early 50s and was very active and lived for many more years until her death from a car accident. Furthermore, he had a history of moving his family in the middle of the night to another state without even giving an explanation. His mother was also described as a sick enabler of her son. She was uninvolved with her other children, spoke horribly of them, and even allowed her husband to repeatedly molest them as they grew up. Denise eventually stopped communicating with Wright after his letters turned to horrible things about his sister, Denise's mother. He stated that when they were children, her mother enjoyed being molested by their stepfather. 
It was clear that Wright has a very perverted, sadistic mind, and Denise was probably never going to get any clear answers from him. The circumstances of Toby's disappearance are very unclear. Did he ever make it off that property alive? Did he run away and meet with foul play? Is he buried somewhere on the five-acre property where Wright and his family lived? Law enforcement has never been able to find any indication that Toby was alive after 1986. Many believe that Toby was murdered and his body is buried somewhere on Wright's former five-acre property in Oregon. The family also suspects Wright in another missing person case in Oregon, and he is a possible suspect in the murder of a young girl at a campground in Arkansas. He was confirmed to be camping in the same area in Arkansas at the same time the murder occurred. Around 2020, the police allegedly requested the landowner's permission to search his former property to see if Toby's body was buried there. However, the outcome of that request is unknown. It's also unclear when Wright will be eligible to appear before the parole board again, but it's tough to imagine that this man could soon be let out on the streets again after ruining so many innocent lives. Toby's parents' death so soon after Toby went missing is likely the reason his disappearance fell through the cracks. Toby's younger sister, Marcy, provided her DNA in case any unidentified remains are ever found. His surviving loved ones are even more desperate now to find Toby and lay him to rest after discovering these horrible details. But as of September 2022, Toby has never been found and this case remains unsolved. <laughs>